So let me get started. So basically, my part of the presentation is going to be about lessons learned by me working on the uh, Changa kernels. Uh, this is a, a, a n-body cosmological application under Professor uh, uh, Tom Quinn, University of Washington, with collaboration with the PPL lab at UIUC. And I got to uh, basically optimize the kernels that were available for uh, the K20 access on the blue waters. Um, so basically, I'm going to tell you some of the lessons learned about what happens when you over-optimize these kernels and how you can basically get around this problem. So before I can really get started about uh, discussing this, I kind of briefly have to go about what are the main bottlenecks with CUDA kernels. Um, I'm going to briefly go about, uh, around this, uh, talk about these two uh, uh, bottlenecks briefly, and then the next one is the one that I'm going to talk about in more depth. The first one is compute bound, which is probably the nicest one to have. Uh, most of the time spent in the kernel is basically in arithmetic op operations. The compute cores are kept well supplied by the memory subsystem, and basically all the latency is hidden by computation. Uh, basically, if, if your kernel is here, the only way you can do better is by basically buying the next generation of GPU. You'll have more cores, you can do better. So it's a great place to be. The next one is bandwidth, uh, bandwidth bound type of kernels. And this is what happens when most of the time it's really being spent in memory operations trying to get data from global memory. And your computer units basically are under supply. They're all waiting for data. Uh, and uh, this is a, usually happens when you have naive kernels. Usually your first version of the kernel might be bottle, uh, bottlenecked by global memory usage. And the best way to go around this is basically by start using the uh, the memory hierarchy in CUDA GPUs and uh, start optimizing uh, in, in the uh, way people teach CUDA uh, GPU classes, you know, you share memory, uh, uh, thread coarsening, et cetera. So the next type of bottlenecks is uh, usually found in the most optimized types of kernels. And this is usually characterized when you have both low compute and both utilization in both memory and compute uh, in the kernel. So in the graph you have here, this is actually come from one of the Changa kernels, you have about less, less than 40% comp uh, computation and slightly better memory usage. But we are barely using half the GPU. Um, basically the main factor for this type of uh, behavior is that um, unlike CPUs, GPUs deal with uh, latency by using computation to hide the latency. And when you're using half the, the GPU capabilities, you don't have enough threads on deck to hide the latency by other threads. Um, so in this case, you basically are using half the threads that you have available, and when threads are waiting for memory, you cannot hide them well enough. Um, and so what you have to do is basically look at the reasons for this type of behavior, and in most of the cases, this is due because you optimize the kernel with shared memory and other resources, without really thinking about how much of those resources are available. So uh, let's take a look at what are the resources that basically bound the utilization of your GPU, and basically are, are, uh, there are four in this table, and I also have different GPU uh, architectures. And so basically here you have you know, maximum number of threads per SM, maximum number of blocks per SM, shared memory per, th uh, share memory per SM, and maximum number of registers per thread. In reality, you want to kind of break this table in two. Um, you have some, uh, you don't see my mouse, you have some control over the shared memory you're going to use, um, and you have a very small control of the register usage, um, but you do have some control. And the shared memory you're using and the register you're using basically are going to control how many threads you're gonna be able to launch per SM, and how many blocks you actually get to schedule per block. So in reality, you wanna look at the uh, right-hand side of this table, and Blue Waters is right there. Uh, the other story that you wanna take, um, you wanna uh, pay attention to in this table, is that let's say you wrote your kernel for Fermi architecture, and you wanna move to the Kepler architecture in Blue Waters, um, it's important to know that, well, you got double the number of threads per SM, you got double the number of blocks per SM, and you got uh, also an improving number of registers, but shared memory remained constant. It was the same. 
So if you really wanted to use double the number of threads and double the number of blocks, you better hope that your threads are using half the number of shared memory. Otherwise, you're gonna come to the problem that you're only gonna be able to use half the available GPU uh, computation because you're gonna run out of shared memory, basically. So uh, let's apply this to uh, the Chunga kernels. And so uh, this is one of the Chunga kernels and we use NVIDIA profiling tools, MVProf. Uh, this is available in Blue Waters. And some of these lines are basically taken straight out of the MVPro MVProf uh, profiler. Uh, it told me that I was using about six KB per uh, uh, offshore memory per block. And basically that was bounding me to have only eight blocks out of the 16 blocks ready to launch at any one time. And this was all because of shared memory. So uh, what happens when you get this report? Basically you look through your kernel, you look where you use shared memory, and you take those shared memory and make them into private variables. I know this sounds kind of counterintuitive because we usually tell you to use shared memory uh, for these kind of situations, but um, it, this is what happens when you need to think really about your resources. So we commented out all the share, uh, some of the shared memory arrays, and we made them registers, and uh, I know this sounds simplistic because many of the kernels are more complex and use shared memory for Inter, uh, complex reductions within the warp, um, but CUDA also offers you know, these shuffle instructions that allows you to do this uh, shared register information across threads within a warp uh, that can get you around, uh, so can get you beyond the need to use shared memory for these types of patterns. And that's exactly what we did, we used shuffle instructions. The other nice thing that comes with removing shared memory and using shuffle instructions you can get rid of some synchronization steps that requires you to make sure that every th thread has loaded the proper value into shared memory. So you also get an improvement here. So we did that, and this is basically what we got out of the profile. And uh, you can immediately note that this is not great. This is not what we wanted. We got some improvement. Uh, we went from 40 to slightly about 40, and the memory went down. It went down because we step, uh, we start uh, less use of uh, shared memory. So we have less uh, memory utilization. This is not great, but the other th resources that could probably be limiting you is registers. So we had an idea what was gonna happen, so we reprofiled, and exactly what we thought, now the profiler is telling us that we are basically bound by register usage. So he told me that I was using about 56 registers per thread, and overall this maxes me out to use four blocks out of the 16. So I'm actually right now in worse shape than I was before, and probably I'm in worse shape because of the optimization that I did last step, because now I'm using private variables that probably are increasing my register usage. So what do you do in this case? Um, so uh, you can't really control register usage uh, by yourself. This is a step that the compiler use, uh, takes and that's some interesting uh, arithmetic uh, to try to balance number of registers each thread is gonna have and the resources that is available. But their compiler doesn't have all the information available for it. So you can kind of give it hints uh, using some of the CUDA API. And this is the launch balance qualifier. It takes two parameters. It takes max threads per block and min block per multiprocessor. The second parameter is actually optional. I usually leave it at one, as one. Uh, so what you do with the max thread per block is that if let's say you're launching 256 threads, essentially you're gonna lie to the compiler and say I'm actually gonna use double. And what the compiler is gonna do is says, well, I need to account for double the number of threads, so I need to uh, spread the, the registers um, appropriately. So you're actually gonna use less registers per thread. Um, but this is kind of a dangerous game to play because essentially when you lower the number of registers, you are increasing the number of, uh, of local uh, memory accesses and also increasing the number of instructions that eventually you're gonna put in the PTX because now you have to load instruction and go to memory and get the resource that used to be in a, in a, in a register. So this is something that you wanna keep playing and iterating through until you find the right, uh, the right balance. So with this, this uh, we applied this optimization, and this is the result that we got. Uh, this is what we really wanted. We went from about 40% utilization uh, to approximately 70% of utilization. This is much better. Uh, 
Um, you ideally want to see around 80 um, out of the uh, total 100. Um, but when we tr kept trying to minimize the number of registers, we start getting penalties because we were just going to memory all the time. Um, so this is something that you really want to take into account. So what does all of this mean in terms of speed up? Because at the end of the day, if this doesn't run any faster, it's worthless if you have more utilization. So these are the two kernels we uh, improved in Changa, particle gravity computation and non-gravity computation. Both of these kernels were not trivial kernels, were highly optimized. Uh, they were using all the proper techniques that we you teach in class, thread coarsening, shared memory usage. The problem was that when they optimized, they didn't take into account the number of resources actually available in the GPU. Um, at the end of the day, we improve uh, utilization from 40 to 70, getting about 1.66x speed up, and the other one we got from 30 to 60, getting about 2.1 times x, uh, x speed up. So you can see that when you write GPU kernels, um, is essentially uh, really important to profile because you could maybe get 5x, but you don't know if you left around two extra x in the table um, because you didn't, didn't know if you're using the resources properly. So it's a really important lesson of profile your application, make sure what is the bottleneck, um, and that will basically let you know what is the next optimization you should apply. Um, with that, I'm gonna leave it for Carl, who is gonna talk about different types of, uh, different type of nodes from Blue Waters and taking an application from Blue Waters to this type of node. Um, any questions before I give it off to Carl? Yes. Actually, you're right. Um, so now they have optimized that. Uh, before you couldn't do that, I can remember what could a version allow the compiler now to take a flag that specify the number of registers. But it's essentially the same thing, yes. All right. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'm Carl Pearson. I'm another one of Winmay's PhD students. And um, I'm gonna tell you a very different kind of story than Simon told you. Simon told you a story about getting some performance speed up uh, after doing a bunch of blood and sweat and tears. And I'm gonna tell you a story about getting performance speed up after paying NVIDIA and IBM a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> what we have is um, the application that is the context in this is um, a full wave inverse scattering application that we're working on. So this isn't uh, really associated with our work for paid, but it's a scientific application. So basically we have some object that we're trying to reconstruct. We hit it with a known field uh, and we have a bunch of receivers and we record the scattered field. Uh, and based on the known field and the scattered field, we can reconstruct the object in question, right? So this is great if you're trying to do medical imaging or look for things underground or look for things in the air, design antennas or what have you. Um, I'm not gonna go deep into the physics of this problem because I can't. Uh, I was brought on board to do a G some GPU stuff for it. But um, basically the gist of it is that in our discretize, we reconstruct the object uh, on a, like a discretized pixel grid. So we're kind of trying to get an image. Uh, and what this involves is computing a bunch of pairwise interactions between all the pixels. And so the approach that this application takes is something called the multi-level fast multipole method. So instead of computing n squared interactions between n pixels, um, you compute local interactions between local groups of pixels, uh, and then you aggregate the effect of those local interactions. Uh, you, so you cluster each group of pixels spatially, and you aggregate those effects. Uh, and then uh, for near pixels, you do the direct computation, uh, the pairwise interactions, and for long-range pixels, you only take into account the aggregated effect. Uh, and so this is called the multipole method, and if you sort of aggregate your aggregated clusters and do that again for even longer range clusters, then it becomes uh, multi-level. Uh, and in this way, you can kind of imagine how that n squared work. Uh, we have like log n levels, and in each step there's like n over two, and so it comes out to order n work. Um, so that's kind of the, the, te uh, the technical interest of this. Um, and so there's a bunch of pixels on the bottom of this image, and so we sort of cluster them hierarchically in different levels. And so there's a variety of different phases, but basically there's a set of kernels that sort of aggregate the pixel information, and there's a set of kernels that shift the pixel information over long ranges. Uh, there's a set of kernels that redistributes that information down the tree. And there's a set of kernels that do near field interactions. So we've got like six or seven or eight kernels, something like that. 
uh, and they all, they're all matrix operations. Um, so some of them are dense, some of them are sparse, some of them have particular features. Um, but they're all matrix operations, so they're pretty straightforward and relatively easy to write on the GPU. So that's kind of the takeaway. Um, so we're all here because we all run on blue waters, um, but something that, uh, so I guess I should back up. Well, it's fine, we can do this. So we write, oh, sorry, that should be XE6 and XK7. Um, but right, so Blue Waters has two different kinds of nodes. It has CPU nodes that have two um, multi-core AMD CPUs uh, for a grand total of 64 gigabytes of memory and 16 floating point units supporting 32 threads. And if you use a GPU node, so an XK node, you get a K20 uh, instead of one of those CPUs, right? So you have less RAM, you have some GPU RAM, um, you have fewer floating point units on the CPU side. But um, new, there's a good chance that future supercomputers are gonna have nodes that look more like uh, the column on the right. So we have two CPUs. Uh, in this particular case, this system has Power 8 CPUs uh, from IBM, so they're not x86. Um, but each CPU has 10 floating point units. And instead of two-way multi-threading like you might see on a current Intel chip or on Blue Waters, how we have two integer schedulers per floating point unit, this one supports eight threads, uh, eight wide SMT instead of two wide. So the system as a whole supports 160 concurrently executing CPU threads. Uh, and it also has four GPUs uh, instead of just one. So each GPU is a P100 with 16 gigabytes of RAM on board. Uh, and that RAM is HBM2, so the bandwidth is like triple the bandwidth on Blue Waters. And the interconnect between those GPUs, I guess I can jump to the next slide now, uh, is something called NVLink. And so this picture is actually somewhat inaccurate, but when we have the MLFMM, so the fast multipole solver, on Blue Waters we have it implemented in a way where it can use up to 16 GPUs, and then we can stamp out, in the actual application execution, we stamp out many parallel uh, uses of that solver. So that's how we use a lot of nodes on Blue Waters. But uh, so in this test, I basically took our four MPI implementation on Blue Waters and moved it over to run on the IBM system. Uh, and so since these MPI ranks don't really care what hardware they're running on, uh, this is kind of a like-for-like -like comparison. Um, and actually, this picture is a little bit inaccurate. So you, there's arrows on the uh, S822LC side that says NVLink. So instead of the, I think it's like 8 or 16 gigabyte PCI links on Blue Waters, those are each 80 gigabyte links. And also, there's point-to-point -point links between the GPUs that aren't shown on here that are also 80 gigabytes. So if your particular application is bound by the cost of moving data between GPUs or onto GPUs, uh, you're gonna get some relief probably on the next supercomputers that are built. Um, so, right, so what I'm showing you now is just something with four MPI ranks running. Uh, and the great news is that it's way, way faster. So on the right-hand side here, we can see on the top, this is uh, just performance of running on XE and XK nodes on Blue Waters. On the bottom right is performance just running under different characteristics on the 822. So uh, the one thread is a sequential CPU execution. You can see the light gray bars are the runtime and the dark gray bars are the speed up over the sequential execution in the respective graph. So you can see when we use four GPUs, say, on the lower right, we get a 969 times speed up over one CPU thread. Um, and you can kind of do the comparison yourself for, you know, on the IBM system we get, when we use 160 threads, we get a 26x speed up. Um, but kind of the interest, some of the interesting things are, uh, if I, you pull the numbers out of this graph and crunch them, uh, when we're moving from this current Blue Water system, which is relatively old uh, in computer land, and move to this new system, the CPU, single thread CPU performance changed by only 17%. Um, and, but when we compare multi-thread, so sort of the fastest multi-thread implementation we have on Blue Waters, the speed up grew to 1.75. Um, but importantly, the, the code executing on a single GPU uh, increased by five times. So the GPUs in these new systems are way faster than the GPUs on Blue Waters, and this is with no changes to the code. So this is no, nothing like the effort Simon did. I just took our code over to Blue, or from Blue Waters to this system. I had to change one little thing to deal with the MPI ranks all being on the same node, but there's no change to that code and it's five times faster. 
Um, and if you look at on kind of a per node basis, so the fastest implementation I have on Blue Waters is the one GPU implementation, and the fastest implementation I have on the IBM system is four GPUs, then we're talking a speed up of like 20 on a per node basis. Uh, so these are some pretty nice results. Uh, all we had to do was pay a lot of money to buy a new system. <laughs> Um, but so there's some kind of interesting things. Why, what the, what's the reason for this? So Simon showed a little bit of information about this, but basically um, the core clocks on the new GPUs are like twice as fast. So all else being equal, they're gonna be able to do twice as much work per unit time. Uh, the memory bandwidth is like three times higher. So if your memory bandwidth bound, you'd expect a three times per, uh, memory performance improvement. If you're bound by things like shared memory bandwidth, it's actually even better. The aggregate shared memory bandwidth is e even higher. Um, but there's basically the way these new chips are designed is that each thread is given more resources. So a little more shared memory, more registers, but each SM um, can handle fewer of the threads at the same time, but there's way more SMs. So in aggregate, the chip is much faster. Um, so I took a particular one of our kernels. So our average kernel time improved by like five. These numbers are slightly different because it was a more detailed run that I did to get some new information. But uh, the MLFM M speed up is still about five. But I had a particular kernel that sped up by eight, which was way more than the rest. So I thought I'd dig into it and look a little bit why. Uh, and actually, this was another kernel where their performance was limited by, uh, the occupancy was limited by the amount of shared memory that was being used, this is the exact case that Simon was talking about. And so on these new GPUs, um, the reason that this was so much faster is because the new GPUs basically have more shared memory available per thread block, so the occupancy was higher. Um, I just looked into that. There's not too much to say there, but there it is. So, you know, some things that I kind of learned in this simple experiment was that I glossed over this a little bit while I was talking, but if I have some particular sequential CPU execution and it's not super well optimized in terms of fully utilizing memory bandwidth or floating point units, if I can stamp out 160 of those threads instead of 32, uh, basically I'm relying on the hardware to do more of the optimization work in some sense than me. Um, because if I have 160 threads all trying to issue floating point and memory instructions, it's gonna have more utilization than 32 threads. So that was kind of a nice feature. So we end up getting you know, more speed up uh, by using 160 threads than 32. Um, on the CUDA code, there's a lot of direct speed up, it seems, just from moving your CUDA code over without any work. Uh, and in some cases, like Simon was saying, uh, if you're willing to put in the effort to tune your kernel, I'm sure you could get even more for these new architectures. So this was kind of a simple experiment, but it was some scientific code in the future. Things are looking pretty bright. That's what, that's what I've got. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, that was, yeah, with OpenMP. Um, I think it was using G++. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know of any group that has put in, uh, do you know of any groups that have put <laughs> Do you know of any groups who have put in um, similar effort optimizing their code for CUDA and Xeon Phi? Um, we see a lot of single comparisons showing it, you know, both are really hard to optimize, but mm -hmm. just, I don't see many head-to-head -head comparisons. So I don't have experience using the Xeon fees, but I think that, so the programming model is somewhat different. I think when you're writing code for the Xeon fees, you typically write it with uh, OpenMP, and maybe these days also with MPI. Uh, and the other ones, uh, the GPUs are written with CUDA. So I think, the, part of the problem is that the two source codes are gonna look very different. Um, and so you could talk, like it's hard to say, you know, we did this optimization and we did the same optimization for Xeon Phi. I think you can do the same kind. You could sort of do optimizations that are maybe trying to achieve the same goal. But I think that might be why we don't see too many comparisons, just because it's hard to draw a direct line. It's kind of e too easy for people to pick it apart and ask, okay, like what's really going on here? What's really having this effect? But I was thinking more in terms of programming effort, like oh. spending one month on CUDA versus uh, yeah. Um, I actually don't know anyone who's looked into that. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's out there though. But <laughs> 
still want it. Um, but they're trying to make it less uh, difficult to get a phone power. Uh, but I think they still have some ways to go. Yeah, Veronica. Uh, well, so I have a question too, but just to, to follow up on that, I know we've done some studies with that with NAMD, and we've worked with people from NVIDIA and Intel to optimize both sides respectively. And in general, the Intel side is a little bit easier, um, but still requires a lot of basically the same level of kind of kernel tuning that you would do in CUDA to optimize uh, the stuff that we want to run on a KNC or KNL. Okay. Um, but my question was in regards to the future platform you were discussing, uh -huh. um, you mentioned a node to node comparison. Yeah. So one question I have is, how realistic do you think that is? Because everything that I've seen makes it seem that if future systems have much fatter nodes than they currently do, they'll be a lot more powerful, but there'll also be fewer nodes. So in terms of a full system performance, um, do you expect, like, what, what kind of performance characteristics do you expect to be different at a full-scale Blue Waters run versus a full-scale future IBM machine run, for example? Okay, so, uh, I think it's, so I think it's fair to, yeah, so this is a good point, of course. Um, so I think it's the sort of aggregate power budget for the supercomputers, uh, my impression is that it's not going to be changing dramatically. So if I'm building a bigger computer than Blue Waters, you know, maybe I'm willing to use twice as much electricity, but I'm not willing to use 10 times as much. And so sort of an aggregate performance using the whole system uh, is gonna be limited by basically the performance per watt that you can get out of the nodes. And so if the nodes can get a huge amount of speed up, um, like moving code from CPUs to GPUs and get more performance per watt, um, in some sense that GPU speed up number is kind of like performance per watt because the power budget of the P100s and the power budget of the K20X is probably pretty similar. So, um, so maybe something like, yeah, so maybe the 20 number would be optimistic for, for a whole supercomputer, but I think the, the five maybe is plausible in the same power budget, but I'm kind of just riffing now. Also, there's, there's the whole argument about having fat nodes is that you don't have to go through the interconnect. To this is true. Better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, and in this case, uh, we didn't really end up investigating that because this application, at the scales we're running it at, we've entirely overlapped the MPI communication with. Uh, it's just because of this particular application that we didn't really get to see anything like that. But that's a good point. Yeah, I have a question. So how do you see the single core performance, especially the integer performance comparison between the uh, Power 8 CPU with versus the uh, AMD CPU on Blue Waters? Because I think uh, if it goes to the fat node, then the, the majority of the computation power in terms of floating points comes from the GPU and the CPU is just like a uh, driver for the whole program for the control flow. So I think mm -hmm. it's more important to to investigate the uh, single, I mean, the integer performance of the CPU itself. Yeah, um, and this is a good point. So this was a simple experiment. I didn't really dive that deeply into the CPU performance, but anecdotally, what we've heard from people is they've done some experiments about, you know, driving GPU intensive codes with like e weak CPUs, like ARM CPUs, mm -hmm. and sometimes the CPUs in that case becomes. Um, uh, relatively limiting for the performance of the whole system, kind of like you're saying, because the CPU has to do a little bit of control flow, set up the kernels, and launch them. Uh, but I don't have a, uh, you know, really a useful answer for you on that, for this, but, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah, I would believe that. Yeah. Okay, any other question? Okay, please, thanks, speakers yeah, again. Thank you.